All right. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, most beneficent, most merciful. We're bringing you another show, right? Instead of waiting all the way till Sunday. And again, this show, yes, I'm sorry, it's unexpected, random. But if you miss it, you, you know, just catch the just catch the replay. That's all. Uh, this was not planned, uh, but until I saw, um, I, ha I happened to come across another video of uh, Bill Warner, a recent video, called 20 Questions About Islam. So I decided to take a listen to it, and uh, well, what I heard disgusted me and motivated me to say, you know what, let me do another refutation of this, this lying bigot. All right? So... That's what we're doing here. Uh, before we go further, let me go ahead and uh, send out a couple of tweets. Don't forget, for those who are watching and those who watch it later, don't forget to like the video, share it, retweet it, post it on your Facebook page, share it on Instagram, whatever. Let's get it out there on social media. All right. So let me just send out some more tweets real quick so we let everybody know that it's live. Okay. All right, we just did that. So we want everybody to join and join in. Okay. So the numbers may be a little low tonight. It's late, a little bit later than usual. 10, about 10, yeah, about 10, 20 right now, Eastern Standard Time. But if you're up and you want to, you know, listen to a good topic, come on, join on in, join in, inshallah. All right. Don't forget, you can always uh, support us by utilizing the links that you see on the screen. They are also in the description of this video. We could use your help in expanding our platform and being able to do more videos. So help us out. Make a donation through the Cash App, PayPal, or sponsor us on a monthly basis through our Patreon if you're not familiar with Patreon, if, I, if you haven't heard my previous shows, Patreon is a platform that allows you to support content creators that you follow and like and you would like to support their work. So basically, you go to the website, uh, as you see in the link, which will take you to my particular Patreon page. You become a what they call a patron, which allows you to make a pledge to support you know me as the content creator that you like whose work you like on a monthly basis you know and there are different what they call tiers of support you know ranging from five dollars ten twenty fifty a hundred or more right you, you decide which is best for you and your budget and you know whatever you can afford to help out with and by doing so you will have you get you know and the way they set it up is that you get special access to um content that may only be for people who are patrons. So everyone else does not have access to the to the content that you'll be able to see. So you know there might be I might do a certain video and it it'd only be for those who are my Patreon supporters. I release certain information. Uh, I write like right now I have a lot of my debate notes that I utilize in these videos or in my debates that I've used in my debates in the past or in the future or whatever. And you can utilize those, right? You, you have access to those that you can use for yourself, for your own notes, when, in, in your own discussions with family, friends, co-workers, or if you're just doing dawah or whatever the case may be, or use them on social media, wh however you want to use them in the purpose uh, of serving Islam, right? And Muslim. So right now, you would have access to those if you become a patron like that. And then, like I said, as time goes on, we'll do other things. You know, it might be a video that's only for my patrons. But it allows you to support the work that I do, and allows me, you know, and that your support allows me to be able to do more of the work that I do, more videos, you know, more debates, etc. And that's the idea. And then you make a pledge, and you know, you you make a payment uh, once a month. The site will, you know, will um, debit your, your your credit card or whatever, pay or your PayPal account, however you you know utilize it to uh, make the payment. And it'll debit it every month, once a month, based on what you pledged. Okay. So you can do that, or you can just make a you know a random donation through Cash App or PayPal. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into tonight's subject. Uh, 
Amrul Afiq, welcome, assalamu alaikum. The Muslim skeptic. Oh yeah, the masked Arab is getting worse. Definitely, we'll check that out. I'll definitely check that out. All right, so let's get into Mr. Bill Warner and his new video, 20 Questions About Islam. So we're going to listen and we're going to rebut his answers, the answers that he gives to these questions. Because a lot of what he said, as you heard in the last video, I refuted him. They're wrong, they're incorrect, they're false, or he outright just didn't tell the truth. He lied. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it without further ado. Oh, and before I go any further, hello. Before I, before I go any further, uh, remember, uh, I used the footage under the what they call Fair Use Act, which allows you to use footage of other persons that may be copyrighted, you know, uh, in order for the purpose of education or commentary, political commentary or educational commentary. It's allowed for you to use it in those senses then. All right, so let's go. Some time ago, I posted on Facebook that I would answer 20 questions, and now it has come time to do that. First question is a history question. At what point did Western leaders begin to completely ignore the conquest doctrine of Islam? Well, it turns out you can find this out if you study naval history. Britain was a naval power, and the technology changed such that you had a better boiler for a ship if it was fueled by petroleum as opposed to coal. Now, Britain had plenty of coal, but it didn't have any petroleum. So all of a sudden, the scholarship in Britain changes from being critical of Islam to friendly towards their new Muslim friends who had a lot of petroleum. So about the time of the first... All right, so let's address that. Really, that's not really what it was. That's not really what it was. Uh, at, at, at the time, as time started to go on, the Muslims seemed to become dormant, right? You know, they, 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 they weren't, uh, you know, they, they didn't build uh, any substantial navy... They didn't build any substantial fighting forces or whatever, whereas the West, because of its white supremacist uh, and its, its bloodthirst for conquest and subjugation of other people, they really didn't have to ignore anything because they were the, they, they were the ones they were the ones themselves who were on this quest to dominate and subjugate the world. So by the time that the Western powers were coming on the scene to start to dominate, the Muslim Empire had already started to wane. Right? The Muslim empires and powers started to wane already. It was the Europeans who were running around, you know, as Christian, Christian invaders and colonizers upon this earth. So it wasn't a matter that, that they had to, uh, when did they start to ignore Islam? They had, they were, they, the, the, the Muslim empire was already waning. You know? It was already waning. And the Europeans were bloodthirsty for conquest subjugation and of course the spreading of their white supremacy so no bill it, it wasn't it wasn't a matter of that the british I mean, you know that may be that may have been some part of but no it, it wasn't that though it was but it wasn't because they, they didn't ignore it because they wanted petroleum right because before because before that fact before oil was discovered right before they discovered the oil in the muslim lands the muslim empires weren't really not much to heard of they weren't really hurt you know you, you really didn't hear anything about them from the 14 basically like from the 14 1500s it was all europeans so it wasn't a matter of ignoring it was that the europeans were themselves already you know running upon starting to starting to leave europe and starting to conquest you know the various peoples of colors upon the earth and so they weren't they weren't even really thinking about islam at that point because they were conqu you know conquering invading and colonizing whereas that time period the muslims weren't you know were pretty much relegated relegated to the Middle East and North Africa. You wasn't really hearing nothing. The Muslims weren't, you know, they weren't, not too much was going on in that regard. The, the, it was the Europeans who were the ones who were running upon, running upon the earth and ravaging and con conquering and, and colonizing and subjugating. First World War is when European intellectual history began to shift and see what, what nice things Islam is. Next question. Why does the left succumb to political Islam? Well, I have one answer for you, victims and totalitarianism. You see, the left loves a victim and hates the oppressor. 
Well, it turns out Islam also loves the victim because you see Muslims are always the victim. They're never the oppressor. Now, of course, he's mean. He's 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 being sarcastic about Muslims, you know. But really, this is this is a false claim that that these right wing bigots like to make up that supposedly, you know, the Muslims and the left are in some type of alliance. It's it's a, it's a conspiracy theory that really doesn't have much proof, right? There's really no evidence for this. This is something that they made up themselves to try to either they want to try to tarnish, the, you know, liberals in the West. They want to try to discredit them by making this claim, you know. But really, I haven't seen any evidence of any any actual real alliance between, uh, you know, liberal left lefties in in the West and and Muslims, right? So this is just something that they use as a slander tactic to uh, about for liberal progressives in in the West. Reality, no 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 such official alliance is, is there. And. This thing about the victims that the Muslims, you know, he's being, of course, like I said, he's saying it in a, in a sarcastic manner. He's trying to be sarcastic about it, you know, but the reality, the reality, though, is that, you know, because he, he, he's going to, you'll listen, he's going to talk about 9-11. He's like, oh, 9-11, the Muslims were the victims rather than the people that they attacked. And as I've shown you on many shows before, that the reality is that not, not in the 9-11 case, not, not in the 9-11 case, but prior to 9-11, and after 9-11, Muslims have continuously been truly the victims, Bill. And of course, your, 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 your deflection from that and your unwilling to acknowledge that is just, as, I, as I've said before, is nothing more than the, this white supremacist outlook that you, know, you, 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 get, you and people like you want to try to ignore the fact that you have done things to violate Muslims and their lands. So in actuality, they are really victims. Now, 9-11 is a different case. And of course, there's questions about who actually was behind 9-11. But 9-11 aside, before 9-11 and after 9-11, Muslims have indeed been the victims of what, you know, uh, what the West, Western nations have done to them. So to pretend like that's, you know, like that's not a reality is nothing more than the typical white racist uh, and white supremacist and Western supremacist attempt to avoid the wrongdoing that they have perpetrated, you know, uh, upon Muslims, right? But as, as I've shown on previous shows, when you look at, you know, uh, um, you know, many of those people who have had uh, been involved in any attempted terrorist attack or any terrorist uh, attack, unfortunately, right, unfortunately, they, they, they're carrying out their anger in such a way that they, their motivation was the fact that the West had done something to them or to Muslims, that the West or America had bombed. Their, their village back in whatever country or that their family had been killed by some missile strike or some bombing so bill you know i know a lot of you white supremacists like to pretend like you guys don't do anything wrong but the reality is that you have done things wrong now this just this does not i repeat this does not justify muslims in return trying to harm in you know westerners who haven't had done anything to them but to pretend like there isn't some legitimate cause behind or motivation behind what they you know their anger is a complete fallacy bill it's a complete fallacy they're always the picked on that is on 9 11 september 11 2001 the real victims were not the people in the world trade towers the real victims were the muslims because people looked at them with suspicion so now again now you see for him for him to trivialize it with such a BS claim that, oh, you know, the, you know, again, he's being sarcastic, that, oh, the Muslims are victims because people looked at them with suspicion. Now, Bill, you know, you know damn well that wasn't the reason. It wasn't, had nothing to do with no damn suspicion. It had to do with the fact that you Westerners have been bombing, invading, and killing Muslims before 9-11, right? So that's, it had nothing to do with no damn trivial, oh, because they were looked at with suspicion. No, it had to do with the fact that you guys have committed dozens of 9-11s in the Middle East, right? You've committed dozens of 9-11s in the Middle East. So it had nothing to do with no damn, you know, uh, um, because, oh, Muslims were looked at with suspicion and therefore they acted out on 9-11. No, it had to do with the fact that you Westerners have been bombing, doing, you know, you've been bombing them. You've been killing their innocents. And unfortunately, some decided that they were retaliate. I repeat, does it make it right? But again, when these white supremacists, white Western supremacists try to act like 
you know, this came out of nowhere and they don't understand why, you know, Arabs or Arab Muslims are upset with them and why they want to get them and strike them back. You know, this is this is this is the typical deflection by these white supremacists to try to act like they don't know what's going on and they didn't do nothing wrong. When the reality is that you violated these people first. You violated them first. OK, and again, I repeat, I, this is not a justification for them coming back to harm you. But to pretend like, you know, you don't know where their anger comes from is complete bunk. It's complete bunk. And you damn well know it. So this bond of the victim and oppressor is what bonds the left and Muslims together. And no, that's not what that's not because they're like I said, there is no real there is no real alliance. That this, this is just something that these right wing white supremacists like to make up to slander the progressives in their countries. So they want to slander them and try to, to connect them to, you know, ISIS or whoever and act like, you know, the left, the, these progressives are in some kind of alliance with Muslims. And of course, it's, it's, a, it's a type of slander. It's a type of slander, you know. But the reality is that, no, there is no real alliance. And again, they, you know, they, they just don't like the progressives because the progressives are going to call them out on the fact that, you know, they're doing things that are wrong, just like like with the children in cages and all that stuff like that. And, you know, they don't want to hear it. The, the conservatives don't want to hear that. So, you know, they make up these excuses to try to discredit the people who are calling them out. Now, they also have another bond. They both want to take down our society to replace it with a utopian ideal. Uh, again, this is more white supremacist bullshit, too. Uh, that that's not what the, the Muslims I don't know about the liberals but that's not what the Muslims want to do again a, as I've showed you these articles from Glenn Greenwald you know over and over again the the people who have been who have been accused of attempting to commit a terrorist attack or charged with some terrorist attack, they all, all of them always all their, their their constant reason or motivation was not that they wanted to take down any your, your white your precious white society bill their motivation was that you were trying to take down their society, that you were bombing their society, that you were occupying their countries, right? That you invaded, you occupied, you bombed, you destroyed, you killed, you killed them, you killed their innocents, you killed their children, you killed their women and children, right? You droned their, their children, you killed their families. This is what they say. So it had nothing to do, none, none of them say, oh, they, their motivation, they just want to, they want to take over. They want to, they want to make Islam dominant. They want to destroy. No, it was over and over again. You white Westerners have destroyed. You, you're invading their nations. You're destroying their nations. So I'm sorry, Bill. No, no, it, it's not that they want to take you down. It's the fact that they were retaliating, retaliating against you for what you've done to them to actually bring down their nations. In fact, well, alaikum salam to those who are joining in the discussion, Sammy. Welcome. Sheila Dang, Khatib, Omar El Saeed, welcome. Moeen Udin, welcome, welcome. Glad you all could join us. All right, let's continue. With the leftists, it's some form of communism, and with the Muslims, it's some form of Sharia. Now, they think they can... And look, look, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't consider myself a liberal, but this, 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 this thing about liberals being common, this is, an, is another you know, old, white, racist trope that has been used against progressives to always claim that it's communism. Communism is like their boogeyman, you're right? It, it, you know, when they, when they don't have any argument, it's, it's communism. You know, li liberals could be bringing, liberal progressives in the West could be bringing a legitimate concern, a legitimate argument, and these white conservatives always come up with this, oh, it, it's communism. If you go back and check, you'll see that they always, even with Martin Luther King, did you know that? Even when Martin Luther King was marching and fighting and protesting for civil rights against discriminatory racism, these devils would always claim that he was a communist. That, that, was, that, that was their argument. Instead of saying, oh, wow, he has an argument, his argument is just human rights. No, oh, it's communism, it's communism. But these are just deflections because these white bigots just don't want to face the fact that they're doing evil stuff to people. So instead of facing that fact, oh, it's communism. I guarantee, go, go back and look and you'll see that they used to claim that Martin Luther King was a communist. They used to claim he was a communist. But that, of course, if you're smart, you know that's just a deflection. What he had to do with communism? He was just talking about basic human rights, that black people needed to be treated fairly in this society that claims and preaches freedom, equality, and justice for all. He was just saying, that's what we want. But to these white racist devils, it was, oh, that's communism. Isn't that something? 
he was telling them, we want what you claim you promised, which is freedom, justice, and equality. And what did they say? Oh, communists. Isn't that ironic? That he's telling them, no, I want what you say, what you claim are your values. And because he was demanding those values for black people, these racist devils were saying, you're a communist. And I'm like, how is that communist? So are you saying that freedom, justice, and equality is communism? <laughs> these people, there's something else, boy. So, that, so that's really just an old trope that they use to just to deflect and uh, avoid addressing the fact that in reality it is just asking for human rights and to be treated fairly and 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 you know and right and they just don't want to do that so they say oh that's it's communism it's 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 this you know nonsense be buddies but in the end if they do take down our civilization the muslims will take down the left to bring about a sharia society is lying about your real intentions a thing in islam yes it is let me give you an example no, it's not. And the example that you give has nothing to do with it. The example that you give had nothing to do with your, your intentions about lying in Islam, right? Basically, with the, the example that he gives, it would be the equivalent of a CIA agent. So it has nothing to do with Islam, per se. It's just that's a matter of warfare, right? It would be the matter of a CIA agent who has been charged with the task of... Uh, um, you know, taking down a, a, a leader that America doesn't like, for example, right? And you have to go undercover, you're going to have to lie, and, and you know, you're going to be your, your secret agent in order to get your target, right? So no, Bill, that example that you get from that hadith has nothing to do with Islam. That, that, was a, that was about a particular incident. And if you read the full story about this person, it wasn't just because this person was insulting Islam. This person was actually trying to rile up forces to attack the Muslims. So when you read the full story, it was actually this person wasn't just writing poems about is that that's what they always try to say. Oh, you know, <clears throat> Muhammad wanted this man killed because he was writing poems that mock. No, if you read the full story, he was doing more than that. He was actually riling people up and actually trying to get people to attack, physically attack the Muslims. And therefore, they had to deal with him. No different than how the CIA in the United States dealt with people that they considered to be threats and who were trying to rile up people to, you know, uh, matter of fact, I'll give you a perfect example. This is no, no different from how the United States was saying they had to go get, try to get, uh, get, get uh, Bin Laden, right? No different from that. So if they had to send the CIA agent in to, to dress up like he was from the Middle East or whatever to get, they, they would have done that, right? They would have done that. So that's what that, so that's not about Islam. That's just about a matter of, of, of warfare. Example, one of my favorite hadiths. Cobb was a Jewish poet and he wrote a poem that offended Muhammad. And so Muhammad said to his, lead, to his followers, who will kill Ashraf who has offended Allah? So yeah, that's the hadith, like I said. And if you read the full story of the hadith, it was, he, he was doing more than just writing poems. He was actually trying to get people to attack. He was actually trying to build up people to attack the Muslims physically. It wasn't just about some writing some, some daggone poems. But this is how they try to trivialize it, right? This is how they always try to trivialize the things of, in Islam to try to, you know, support their false narrative that Islam is evil and violent. Whereas when you read the actual Islamic source, it tells you the full story that he wasn't, that, that he, wasn't he was doing more than just writing poems. He was actually trying to get people to physically attack and, and, and kill Muslims. And so they had to deal with him. This prophet. And one of the Muslims says, well, I will, Muhammad, but I will need to deceive him. May I do so? Yes, you may deceive him. But look up your own results. Go to the web. Do not use Google because it produces favorable results about Islam, but instead Google with it. Now, that's interesting that he, he would, you see what he says, right? Because it produces favorable. Right, Bill, right, exactly. So you're basically telling these people to try to find only negative things about Islam. Why, why, don't, why don't you want them to look at the favorable arguments that will refute your claim that Islam does not lie, allow you to lie or hide your intentions? Right? Why don't you want them to see that? So what Bill is basically saying is, well, no, don't go to Google because Google is going to allow you to see, because I've done it. Google, see, it shows you both. It'll show you people who, who are trying to attack Islam with their arguments and those who are trying to refute it. So Bill doesn't want people to see that, right? He doesn't want you to come across 
what may be a legitimate rebuttal to these claims. So he says, no, don't don't use, don't go to Google because Google is going to show you favorable results about Islam. So go to this site or go to this kind of browser or go to that kind of browser that will, you know, perhaps only allow you to see the 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 the, the false, the the hate the, the haters claims against Islam, right? The bigoted websites against Islam, the bigoted blogs and liars and bigots against Islam. It'll it'll only allow you to see their content, you know. So don't so no don't don't Google it. No, Bill, why don't you want them to see, uh, you know, see both sides of the coin? Well, we know why because of course you want to promote your false claims against Islam. But I've already refuted Bill and others on this claim about you know the, of course he's running this is the takia line he's running the takia line right here and of course we have refuted that on numerous times if you want to see more details go to my go to my channel look for my video takia the lie they made against islam where we completely destroy this claim that these bigots make that islam uh, uh you know wants you and tells you and you know and encourages you to lie and hide your intentions or whatever the case we've shown it over and over again that islam does not encourage you or tell you to hide or deceive people in everyday life and interaction so bill you're a liar okay and this is not name calling i'm using lie in the literal sense that you you're just lying right you're just blatantly lying and if you want to talk to me about this bill by all means contact me and i'll, I'll be willing to go one-on-one -on -one face to face with you at any time any place any time you let me know because i see you like to have people on your show but you don't seem to bring any any muslims that can handle you know that that'll 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 obviously expose you. But if you're ever up for it, let me know. I'm, I'm here, Bill. All right? Let me know. If you ever, if you ever really ha are courageous and want to face a Muslim who knows what they're talking about and who will refute you and expose you, by all means, I'm right here. Ready. Ready. Just let me know. Just let me know. And we can definitely set that up. Don't Google. And instead, use a browser like Brave or DuckDuckGo and type in Islam and Deception. One world leading has the best understanding of political Islam in your opinion. Well, I'll tell you one, it isn't. It is the Pope, who is an absolute pious fool when it comes to Islam. But I don't want to pick on the Catholics because it turns out that 95% of the churches here in Tennessee are the same way. They're apologists for Islam as well. And when it comes to political leaders, I would say the best leader is Orban of Hungary. In general, the leadership in Central Europe understands political Islam, but they do not understand it at all in France. Right, Bill, and you do, right? No, what, what Bill is saying, it tra let, translate this is that, you know, basically, th this is just that they want everybody to look at Islam the way these, these bigots look at it. And if you don't look at it that way, if you, if you have a, a more favorable, favorable view of it, or more neutral, or more, you know, even, you know, unbiased look at it, oh, well, then you, you don't know what you're talking about, you're a pious fool, like you called the Pope. You know, the, the, because they, they, they want you to look at Islam how these white, from the white racist perspective, right? From the white supremacist perspective of Islam, which is Islam is evil, it's a challenge to us, it wants to destroy us, they want to take over, you know, that's how they want you to look at it. So if you're a political leader who looks at Islam more, if you know, and you know about it really, and you know it's, it's full scope, and you have a more, you know, even-handed view of it, oh, well then, you know, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, he doesn't know any better. You need to look at it the way Bill and, and other, you know, Western supremacists look at it from, which is from their perspective that, you know, it's evil, it's violent, and it's a challenge when in reality, it's them. They're the violent ones. They're the ones who really want to dominate and take over and hold power, right? They really, you know, this is, like I said, this is, this, this all is connected. The Islam, the immigrants, this is all connected to white power, fearful that it's losing its white power. Never forget that. That's what this is really all about. Yeah, exactly, Omar. Exactly, right. When they act like the media supports Islam. Exactly. Exactly. They don't want to consider anyone who lets Muslims live in peace. Yeah, exactly, brother Sammy. It's, that's exactly what it is, right? See, if you want to look, if you want to look at Islam peacefully and more, you know, more with an unbiased view, then you're you're an appeaser, basically. That's exactly right, brother. That's exactly right. All right, let's continue on. France, Britain, and Germany. 
Is it remotely possible to separate religious Islam from political Islam? Yes, it is, because ask yourself this question. Does the action of Islam affect me, a non-believer? Let me give you an example. Prayer in the streets, public prayer. In the United States and Europe, Muslims will commandeer a street or a public area in order to have prayer. Now, that sounds very religious, doesn't it? But commandeering the street is a political action. It is not a religious action. So public prayer where they commandeer a street has a political... No, Bill, it's not. It's not public at all. It's. It's. Not, I mean, it's not political at all. It's exactly what it is. It's a religious. It's, it's a religious thing. The people are praying, and a lot of times when when the Muslims do, if the Muslims do have an event where they get the street, of course, please don't act like they just took it over. They had to get permission from the state or the city or the county in which they live. See, these guys be acting like the Muslims are just coming on and just marauding and taking over. Play no. I, you know, I, I've been part of leadership. In Muslim communities and so I know that whenever they do that they have to get permission from this they don't just take over the place they get permission from the city right if it's a new if it's in the city they get permission from the city the county you know what I'm saying they, they get permission for the county and, and the, and, and, and the uh, state or city that they're in so to pretend like the Muslims are just commandeering and just took over is another lie that you guys you know you, you're promoting when in reality they had to get permission from the Kufar Right. You, act, you guys want to act like, you know, like as if the Muslims are taking over. Meanwhile, whenever we do, whenever, whenever the Muslims have an event that's going to be like that, they go to you, Kufar, you Kafirs to get permission. So how are you? So how is, you know, so this is why this claim that that the Muslims are trying to take over is a bunch of nonsense. Because whatever the Muslims doing in your country, they had to get permission from you. You gave them permission because you're in power. So cut it out with this BS that the Muslims are trying to take over because whenever the Muslims do this, they get permission from you. They have to ask permission, Bill. Stop promoting this fear-mongering garbage that the, Muslims are, that the Muslims are taking over and all of that when in reality, the Muslims are under the authority of the Kufar. When we need to build a mosque, we have to get permission from the Kufar. From the Kafir, right? Whenever we want to have an Eid celebration and we may want to, you know, take over, uh, uh, have a park or, you know, rent out the park or rent out a, a city block or whatever the case, we have to get permission from the Kafir, Bill. Stop acting like you guys are, you know, so stop, stop acting like you guys are, are, are being oppressed when in reality, you give us permission. So you could eat y'all could easily say no you can't do it so whenever there is an event like that you better believe brothers and sisters that the muslims got permission from the kufar to do that the kufar gave them permission because the kufar are in power over the muslims bill stop pretending like you're under some kind of threat when in reality you're not this is nothing more than white racist fear mongering the reality is that the Kufar are in power over Muslims in Western countries. And so whatever Muslims do, from building a mosque to renting out a park or, 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 or city block or whatever, or city block for, for Eid celebration or for prayer or whatever, it is done with the permission of that county administration, the police department, etc. Don't let Bill trick you with this fear of the Muslims trying to take over when in reality the Kufar is in full power and control over Muslims in Western countries. So cut it out. Cut it out. Aspect and a religious aspect. So these two can be two sides of the same coin. But yes, you can always pick out political Islam because it impacts you and me. What can we learn about... And you know what? Let, let me talk about this too, this impacting thing. Uh, years ago, I did a show. Uh, again, you can check it on my channel. Uh, I did a show about the truth about Sharia law. And that really, the, the majority of Sharia law does not impact the, the, the non-Muslim at all. The majority of Sharia does not impact you at all, Bill. You guys are a bunch of paranoid fear-mongering bigots because the majority of fear of, of, of Sharia law political Islam would not affect you at all it most of Sharia law is addressed towards Muslims which has nothing to do with you it wouldn't regulate your life at all 
The only parts of Sharia law that would regulate the, the non-Muslims are the parts that are universal. That everybody agrees you shouldn't steal. Everybody agrees you sh you know you don't you don't commit murder. Those are all those are basically be the only parts that that would affect a, a non-Muslim. And of course, that's those are universal laws. Those are universal laws beyond just Sharia. So it's not that's not even necessarily necessarily Sharia. But under Sharia, that's how it deals with non-Muslims. That the things that we all are universally agreed upon, such as no, that you don't take from other people, you don't commit murder, right? slander and things like that those are universally accepted things those would be the only parts that would apply as far as you having to pray you can't eat pork you can't drink alcohol and all that stuff like that those would not apply to you bill your women would not be forced to wear hijab because the quran says that the, the hijab is for the, the believing woman tell the believing woman to cover so the majority of sharia law bill would not apply to you haters at all so you know i, I I wish you guys would really stop trying to promote this fear mongering. So I repeat, the majority, the overwhelming majority of Sharia law does not apply to, to the non believer at all. The only things that would apply would be the things that are considered universal, as I said. As far as the Kufar could still eat pork under Sharia, the Kufar, the Kafir can still drink alcohol and intoxicants under Sharia. Right? And, and, I, and I showed you before in one of my other videos that. You know, when the Muslims were in power, they even allowed the non-believers to have their own courts. If you had a problem, you could go to your own court. The Christian could go to the Christian court. The Jew could go to the Jewish court, etc. You were they weren't they weren't they didn't have to come to the Islamic court for judgment. They had their own courts where their own judges would judge them. You could go to a Jewish court if you had a Jewish problem. The Christian court if you had a Christian problem. Only if they wanted to come for an Islamic ruling or an Islamic judgment could they come to the Islamic court. That was under Abdul Aziz, the Caliph Abdul Aziz. That's how he, that's how he ruled. He said, you know, you, you, could, you could do. He said in their areas, they could still eat pork. They could still sell and drink alcohol to each other. The intoxicant pro prohibition is for the Muslim. So when they, when they make these claims about Sharia... This is nothing more than their own paranoia, right? This is nothing more than their own paranoia. Understand that, all right? Understand that. Well, the world leaders of Islam say in English, well, we have an easy thing here, memory, Middle East. Yeah, the let's talk about memory, this memory site, right? Memory has been shown to mistranslate some of the the videos the, of, of, the, of the Arabic speakers that they put up they've been exposed before for as mistranslating not properly translating what was said because you know their job of course is to promote and spread hatred of Islam and so you know they've been exposed as as mistranslating a lot of uh, the content that they put out from the Middle East from speakers in the Middle East they've been they've been known and shown and exposed as mistranslating because of course they want to you know they want they want to try to appease their their western masters by giving them something to feed feed their bigotry so no memory is not reliable no media research institute they are excellent they specialize in translating the works yeah, of religious leaders in, in particular false. muslim leaders yeah well yes there was a golden age but we need to look at it many muslims get to this one next question translated in english it is fascinating to go to the memory site, M-E-M-R-I. Was there ever an Islamic golden age or is that wishful thinking? Well, yes, there was a golden age, but we need to look at it. Many Muslims get credit for what Arabs who were Christians did, and so you see, well, this Arab name did a lot of work and whatever, so therefore it must be Islamic. No. Remember, to be an Arab... To no, no. See, again, you see... This, this lets you see that I'm not just name calling. When I say white racist bigot, it's real. It's not just name calling. Because you see what he's doing here? He's trying to discount the Islamic advances in, in, that we've made, that Muslims have made in history, right? He's trying to negate the fact that Muslims, in fact, did have a golden age and did have achievements in sciences and, and, and you know, and, and uh, advancements of you know, throughout history. 
So he's saying, oh no, well, some of the some of them had Muslim names, but they weren't, they were Christian Arabs. No way. I, I every historian that I've looked at says these were Muslim. They were Muslim scientists. They weren't inventions that were created by Arabs who just had an Islamic or Arabic sounding name. I have never heard that before until just now. This is the first time that I've heard such bull BS. Every other time, all the books that I have talk about this, and they're, and they're not Muslim historians either, right? Many of the many of the historians that I've looked on this issue, they admit it was the these were Muslim scientists. They were Muslim scientists who gave us algebra, chemistry, uh, um, you know, the, the the advances in optics and things like that. They were Muslims, not Arab Christians who just had an Arab name. But this is how white supremacy works. So again, I'm saying this. Bill says that he's not for name calling. I'm not, I, when I'm saying white supremacy, I'm not saying this as just, you know, an empty, you know, uh, empty superficial name calling. No, I'm using it in its true and literal form that this is actually white supremacist garbage that he's giving us by trying to now negate and rewhite, <laughs> rewhite, yeah, exactly, re <laughs> that's, a, that's a new word, right? Instead of rewrite history, he's trying to rewhite history. By acting like the Muslims didn't really do anything, you know, it had anything to do with science. But that, that's, that's how white supremacy is, right? It negates the advances and, and, and accomplishments of other people who are non-white. So that's what he's doing here. Sorry, Bill, the reality is that the his, every, just about every historian acknowledges that these, the advances that were made in the past were made by actual Muslims. Not Arab Christians who just had an Arabic sounding name and, and you know, it, they were co-opted and, and said it was, no, it was actual Muslims, sir. It does not mean you're a Muslim. And it used to be that most Arabs were not Muslims. Now, Muslims did some good work, yes, but not much. And you, see, you see, you see, the, the white races can't give you credit. See that? Oh, yeah, they did some good things, but not much. No, devil. Your whole damn European, basically your whole damn advancements in the European history uh, out of the Dark Ages came from Muslims. Every, just, just about every historian acknowledged that, even Western historians. Even honest Western historians tell us that you, we did more than much. That if it wasn't for that, you guys would have still been in the Dark Ages. You would have still been cave beast if it wasn't for your, 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 your uh, contact with the Muslims. And learning from the Muslims. Man, this guy, like, matter of fact, let me see, let me read something to y'all real quick. Just to show you my point. Ah, here we go, yes. Hey, I, I want to read something to y'all just to show you that Bill is full of it. I want to read you something to show you that bill is full of it and that we did more we did more than much we did more than much and that the people like bill you need to thank the muslims for bringing you into the age of civilization sir and like i said if you want it you want to go with it you want to get you want to do this one-on-one -on -one with me please by all means I'm, I, I'm i'm here let me just let me know we can set it up you let me know bill and, and we can definitely set that up for sure i, I would love to get, get a one-on-one -on -one with you or a debate or something, anything. Just let me know. All right, so here we go. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. All right, let's see. Here's a few of them. This is from... Uh, this is from a book entitled... Uh, from W.E.B. Du Bois. It's, it's a book entitled The World... And Africa, right? The world in Africa. And here's what he says. He says about the Muslim African. He says, Gao, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quoting from W.B. Du Bois, the book, The World in Africa, page 211 and 223. He says, Gao, Timbuktu, and Jenny were intellectual centers at the University of Sankor. And, and he says, and at the University of Sankor, this is all in Africa, in Muslim Africa, in Muslim Africa. Africa, gathered thousands of students of law, literature, grammar, geography, and surgery. A literature began to develop in the 16th and 17th century. The university was in correspondence with the best institutions on the Mediterranean coast. Black universities sent black scholars to learn and lecture to the Mediterranean world. 
black historians, and these were when he says black, he's talking about black Muslims historians, right? Like Abdurrahman Al Sadi wrote the Bible of Sudan, Tariqa Sudan, and the and the Tariq Al Fatach. From this Africa, a new cultural impulse entered Europe and became the Renaissance. So here's a Western historian. He's not Muslim. W. E. B. Du Bois was not Muslim, but he's acknowledging the fact that it was the Europeans' contact with the Muslims that brought the Europeans out of what they used to call the Dark Ages into the Renaissance period when the Europeans began to get cultural, right? When they, when they began to become civilized and cultural and they wanted to get into the sciences and, 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 and you know, all those things that would advance their culture and civilization, the Renaissance period, right? How did they get it? That came from their learning from the Muslims, Bill, so your white racist attempt to, to, to minimize that fact by saying, oh yeah, they did some things, but not much, is nothing more than a, a, a white racist in denial. Okay? Uh, let's see, let me, give you, let me give you a couple of other examples. Again, and these are non-Muslim historians, right? Non-Muslim historians talking about this uh, let's see let's see here ah uh, yes here we go here we go here we go here we go let's see yeah here we go here we go this is from the book entitled this is the book by Ivan Van Sertima again he was he was he's not a Muslim this is from a book by Ivan Van Sertima it's called the golden age of the Moor the golden age of the Moor by Ivan Van Sertima here's what he says about how the Europeans bill learned from the Muslims so sorry you can say that we did but not much no the reality is we did more than much sir we did more than much and it was you you owe us you need to be thankful that you came and learned from us. All right. So here's what uh, Ivan Van Sertima in his book, The Golden Age of the Moor. And as you know, the Moors were Muslims. Right. So, and, and, and the way they were depicted in European paintings as they were black Muslims, in fact. They're not depicted looking like they were Arabs. When you look at the description and the paintings of the Moors, the Moors, the Europeans painted the Moors. It, it clearly shows that the Moors were black people black african people who were the moors in europe and they were muslims so here's what here's what Do dr ivan van sertima says or ivan van sertima says he says this he says that uh translations from arabic the medieval language of science into latin the classical european language has been going on since the 10th century centers of translation sprang up all over christian europe in barcelona uh tarazona Lyon, Sargovia, Pamplona, Toulouse, Berzers, Norbonne, uh, Marseilles, Bologna, Salerno, and Paris made extensive use of Moorish scientific treaties. The translations from the Arabic provided links between Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, and England. Alfonso X promoted Moorish erudition at every opportunity. The first university of Christian Spain was founded at Valencia by Alfonso VIII in the 13th century, and the teachers employed were the Muslims and the Jews. Nearly all major universities in Europe sprang up around the same time, beginning in the second half of the 12th century right up through the 13th, a span of about 150 years, a period which coincides with the flowering of Moorish science and the establishment of centers in Europe to translate Moorish treaties from Arabic into Latin. So you see how today it's reversed, right? Today the language of, of knowledge and all that is English in most cases, right? In most cases. But back then it was the Muslims who were the center of knowledge. The Muslims were the center of knowledge and the information was in Arabic. All of the important scientific information, all that, it was in Arabic. And so the Europeans had to translate the Arabic into their language so that, they, so that way they could learn 
from the knowledge that the Muslims had. So, uh, so Bill is telling you that, oh, they did something, but it wasn't much. No, Bill, that's a white racist lie. The Muslims did a whole bunch more. So much so that you Europeans learned from the Muslims. Right? Dr. Ivan Van Sertima goes on to say that several of the Moorish works in mathematics, astronomy, and medicine became standard texts at these universities. For example, Jude Wall, a Moorish work in astronomy, became a standard text at Oxford. Frederick II founded a university at Naples in 1224, and there he established a curriculum which emphasized Moorish scholarship. Under him, all theological studies ceased at Italian universities, and Moorish medicine, somebody in the text said that, Moorish medicine and law became the major disciplines. Okay? Into Europe came the advances of an empire more immense than those of Alexander the Great or Rome at its height. Rice was introduced into Europe by the Moors in the 10th century, cotton by the 9th. A, Mus a, a Moorish botanist by the name of Ibn Basal petitioned the land into, different, into 10 different classes according to particular characteristics and taught the farmers ways of increasing the fertility of their plots. Surveys were done to locate sweet water below the earth. Widespread use was made of the wheel, the water wheel which the Moors had introduced into Spain. The Romans also knew of this, but they had used it very little. The Moors also dug canals and, can and channels to irrigate the farmlands and provide water for the thousands of houses and mosques and palaces and public baths. They not only increased the fertility of the soil which, with their new methods and tools and plants and manures, but they also ushered in the sciences of food preservation and storage. They could store wheat for as long as 100 years. So that's just a little glimpse into the facts of non-Muslim historians telling us about how the Europeans learned from the Muslims and that the Muslims were the center of knowledge that the Muslims had the knowledge and they were the ones that were writing the textbooks right they were the ones that were writing the textbooks and they were the ones that the Europeans right it sounds today it sounds almost people are astonished and shocked to think that the Europeans were the ones at one point had to come and learn from somebody else because today the Europeans are in the forefront, right? But yes, they got to the forefront by learning from the Muslims and then they turned around and betrayed, right? Once they got the knowledge, then they went around the earth, savages, rampaging, colonizing, and subjugating. So Bill's going to talk about that. He's going to say, well, you know, how, how could the Muslims be the ones when the Muslims right today are, are you know, they're, they're not really making it that much advances, Right? They're not making that much advances. Well, most of the people who have been victims of the European colonialists are not making much advances. When at their time, they had advanced societies. For example, I'll give you a couple examples to make this point. Let's look at South America. The South Americans right now are not really making many headways in science today, are they? No, right? But if you go back to when the Incas and the Mayas had lands, look, go back and read the description that the Europeans gave when they first came upon the, 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 the civilization of the Incas and the Mayas in South America. They'll tell you that they had cities and civilization, right? They had cities and civilizations that the Europeans, such, such that the Europeans had never seen. So to pretend like, you know, everybody was backwards and, and, and didn't do anything, well, look, the reason why these people are stagnant is because of white supremacy. White supremacy stagnates other cultures. Cultures that at one point had been advanced. That when they when the Europeans came upon them, they said, Wow, look at look at look at the look at the structures of these people's cities and civilizations that the, the Incas and the Mayas had. Right? Same thing in Africa. Right? And I'm not just talking about Egypt either. Right. Look at look at look what happened to Mansa Musa's culture and civilization. Mansa Musa was very wealthy, very rich, very advanced. Right. Timbuktu was very advanced. What, what's, what's Timbuktu doing now? It's, it's not worth mentioning. But why is that? Why is that? It's because of European invasion and subjugation, Bill. So he's going to talk, you're going to, he's going to mention Pakistan and how come Pakistan isn't doing anything and how come these Muslim countries aren't really doing anything. And, that's, and he's using that to say that, well, how, how could the Muslims have been the ones that were in the forefront when today they don't, they're, not, they're not much to speak about? Well, the answer to that, Bill, is because of European invasion and subjugation. 
That's why they're not much to speak about today because they're under, they're under, they, they have been destroyed. And many times what, what the, the, the West likes to do is by proxy, they like to put up dicks, despotic leaders who they will support who are not trying to advance their own societies anyway. They're only to advance their family and their pockets and they will repress their own people for the benefit of Western domination. That's why, Bill. That's why. So here, listen to what he has to say. You'd have to ask yourself the question, if Islam is such a wonderful basis for science and whatnot, how come this, all the great gains of Islam and the Golden Age was always centuries ago? Look what happens in our modern world. Yeah, Bill, there you go. He, you just answered the question. How come they were centuries ago, Bill? You know why they were centuries ago? And the, question, the answer is white colonialism, Bill. See, that, see th th that's the blinders of the white supremacist. See, he's blinded by his own his own ignorance and his own arrogance that he can't even equate, he can't even put that into equation to see that, oh yeah, why, how come it was centuries ago? Oh, you know why it was centuries ago? Because for the last several centuries, white power has been dominating, Bill. For the last several centuries, we, most people of color, most of these nations have been under white colonialism. Did, Pakistan just got its independence like what? 60, 70 years ago? Right? Pakistan was just created from being annexed from India after the subjugation of India by the British, Bill. What the hell are you talking about? But that's the blinders and the arrogance of white supremacy. That he, he can't even, he can't, he's not even honest enough to factor in the fact that, well, you know, Pakistan just got its independence maybe like, okay, it was like 90 years, okay, it was like 90 years ago, right? Meanwhile, the Europeans, you know, they, they've been subjugating and in control of these nations for how long? Right? It took America 200 and something years to get to where it's at today. Pakistan, only 90 years. Other African countries, 60, 70 years, they just got their independence from being subjugated by white racist Europeans. And then he's wondering, oh, how, how, how come they don't, how come they, how, how come all their advances were centuries ago? Because in the last several centuries, from those centuries ago until now, was when the whites started to invade and dominate and subjugate, Bill. Duh, right? Duh, that's the answer. <laughs> Pakistan is an Islamic country and their GDP rose 20% while in India it rose 190%. So that's much greater growth. What we find is that in the Islamic world is that there's not much progress at all in the terms of science. There's more patents granted to South. So again, see, I remember what I told you guys. Whenever you hear this, when they start doing this, you know, what have they done in science and they want to compare, you know, GDPs and all that. This is that. That's all. All that is is white supremacy trying to put them down and all that. Meanwhile, we know many of these countries, GDPs and all that stuff like that has to do with all, all of this is all, you know, uh, 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 you know, what, what, what happens from white imperialism and colonialism and subjugation. Right. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Stop, you know, Bill, stop acting like, you know, those, those factors of, of, of the, you know, the the consequences of white colonialism, white domination don't affect the way these countries progress. <laughs> exactly, Brother Shazad, exactly. Let's continue. South Korea than all the Islamic world, and that's just one nation. I did a YouTube video on this subject called The Half-Truth of Islamic Golden Age in Spain. Now, one person wrote me a detailed thing which said, I hope you're aware of the difference between the Syriac language and English language in referring to male and female pronouns. And she goes on to give some things about the fact that the Quran was written partly in Syriac, and therefore it has to do with the interpretation. I don't know what the hell they're talking about, Quran being partly. <laughs> oh, boy, these people are something else, boy, I tell you. This, uh, bad. I agree with this, but it's not that important because, you see, my study of Islam... Yeah, you're right, it's not that important because it's, it's complete bunk. But let's, let's, so we'll move on to the next question. I'm in pretty bad shape. So the most of what we want to study are the Hadith and the Sirah of the life of Muhammad, and there this question about the Syriac language in the Quran doesn't really affect us much at all. 
How can we stop them from overtaking America? How do we citizens get rid of political Islam? Well, the answer is we have to face up to the true nature of Islam and persuade our leaders that Islam is not here to improve our life, but instead to improve their life and to create a Sharia world. The, the reality, again, as I said, the reality is that this is nonsense. The Muslims are only like 2% of the American population. How you paranoid bigots think that 2% uh, of the population is, can somehow take over your country is, is complete nonsense. Plus, the Muslims, are, the Muslims in America aren't even showing that. So, the, so where are you guys getting this from? As I've talked about before, there are Muslims who are in your military. They're not in your military. They're in your military. They're fighting for you. They fight who you tell them to fight. How, does that, how, how is that trying to take over your country? Right? That right there shows you that the Muslims are not, they have no intention to take. The fact that they join your military to serve and, and, and fight who you tell them to fight, to fight and kill on your behalf, sometimes even going to Muslim countries, how you take that, at, you know, but again, th th believe me, brothers, this is nothing more than a bunch of paranoid white supremacist bull BS. That's all this is. That's all we're hearing from Bill right now. The, re the reality is that there is no evidence whatsoever that the Muslims are trying to take over. So the, to the question who asked Bill that question, uh, how can we stop from trying to take over, there is no attempt to take over in the first place. Only in the minds of you white racist bigots. It's only in your imagination that the Muslims are trying to take over. The reality is that these Muslims are not trying to take over anything. As I said on my other show the other day, did I say that I think on, the, on the yesterday's show, that the Muslims, I said, they come from other countries and they work in NASA. They're helping your country advance in space technology and sciences. They're helping your country more than their own country. I'm even shocked at that. I've been shocked at that. When I lived in Virginia and I saw these Muslims from other countries working in NASA, and I'm like, man, you could be in your own country helping your own country advance, man. It's not, it ain't like your countries could, you can't use it. But they, but they, for whatever reason, I, I, I can't speak for that. I don't know what's in their mind, but all I can do is speak on the actions. But whatever it is, they're helping your country advance, right? They're helping your country advance. How the hell are you trying to take over? Where, meanwhile, they're giving their expertise. They're giving their knowledge to help you advance. Egypt could use a, a space program, but instead, no, they work for NASA. India, Pakistan could use that. Instead, they work at NASA. Saudi, UAE, Yemen, they could use that, but instead they work at NASA. They're in your military. They're serving you. They fight when you say to fight. They go kill when you say to kill. Hell, you talking about trying to take over. They ain't trying to take over anything. The takeover is in your paranoid imaginations. So the answer to that question is, you stop them by just sitting there, by not having to do anything because they're not trying to take over in the first place. So you don't even have to worry about it. You don't even have to worry about it because they're not trying to take over anything. All they're trying to do is get that money and serve you. Serve you and make you better. So you don't even got to worry about no, time, no, no takeover. Unfortunately, I do not know of any group of people who are activist group who push against Islam in a political fashion. And again, it's spotty. And, and again, all we're hearing here is just, as, as was said earlier, is that Bill just basically wants everybody to hate Islam like he does. That's all. That's the reality here. That's the reality. He, he basically is just saying, look, you know, we, he, we, we, basically he's just saying that him and people like him, they need to try to convince more people to hate Islam. More politicians, more people in power, they need to hate Islam like he does. Don't look at Islam with a, with a like I said, with an unbiased view. Don't try to look at it honestly. Look, no, look at it with a biased view like he does. Look at it from a white racist perspective like he does. That's basically what Bill is saying here. It's here and there, mostly done by do anything, but there are very few groups that are actually doing this work. Obama paid Farrakhan $300,000 to speak at prison. Should this be considered as political Islam? Well, let me ask you this. Since uh, as far as that, I, I've never heard of that. I've never seen any proof of President Obama paying Farrakhan $300,000 to, to speak to <laughs> in prisons. Ne never heard anything about this. All right. Never seen any proof. I, I'll, I'll do some research to find out. But um, this claim, I'm sure, is an unfounded claim. I, I'll definitely check. It. I'll, you know, I'll look it up to, to, to see if we can find anything on it. 
But uh, if, th if that was the case, this would have been all over the news, though, right? It would have been all over Fox News. They would have loved to have exposed that Obama had given Farrakhan $300,000 to speak in prisons and all that stuff like that, right? They would have loved to have done that. They would have loved to have exposed such a such a such an incident that if that had actually happened. So I doubt there's any truth to that that, that President Obama paid, you know, uh, Farrakhan any kind of money. Plus, when when Obama was running for president, he disavowed Farrakhan, right? He publicly disavowed Farrakhan. So this claim that he paid, I'm sure it's a complete lie. Their purpose is to Islamicize and create Muslims out of those in prison who will come out not liking us and not obeying the golden rule. Oh, please, Bill, with the golden rule garbage. You know what? When are you guys going to practice the golden rule? When are you white bigots going to practice the golden rule and treat people how you want to be treated? I'm talking about the damn golden rule. You devils don't even follow that. And really, look, and here, and here's about the Islam in prison thing. No, the Islam in prison thing, when, 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 when you know, people do dawah to people in prisons, it's not about teaching them to hate. It's actually to improve their lives. Like Malcolm X story, Malcolm X story, how Islam had improved his life. He was a criminal, right? He was a criminal, a drug dealer. He was, all, he was in all kind of crimes and all kind of vices before he came, even though, he, of course, even though it was the nation of Islam. But as I said before in previous shows, that even the, the Islam that the nation of Islam has is so powerful that it's still powerful enough to change a man's life to be a righteous man. So when Malcolm X became, a, uh, you know, learned about some Islam in prison through the NOI, look how powerful it was that it changed his life. He gave up selling drugs. He gave up being a, a drug dealer, using drugs, selling drugs, gambling. He gave up all those evil vices that the society, the Christian American society had taught him and was unable to get him to give up until he learned Islam, even if it was, you know, from, from the nation of Islam, which mainstream Muslims may not consider to be, you know, true Islam. But they still read the Quran. They still have the tenets of Islam of, you know, living upright and staying away from fornication and adultery. Those are, those are tenet teachings of Islam. And it was powerful enough that it still transformed him. And even this, to this day, whether it's Sunni Muslims doing da'wah in prisons or whoever, that, that's really what it's about. It's not about trying to teach anybody to hate, to come out of prison and hate. No, it's teaching them to be better people so that way when they come out of prison, they live upright, righteous lives of righteous men and righteous women. And that is the case. Right? That has been the case of those who have become Muslims in prison. That they came out and then they were able to live an upright life. They didn't return to crime. Most of those who do not come, learn Islam, when they come out, many of them unfortunately wind up going back to jail because they were not able to transform their lives. They were not able to correct themselves and live a righteous life. But there's something so powerful about Islam, the discipline that it offers, the righteousness that it teaches, the, 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 the closeness to, uh, to Allah that it, that it commands, that Islam is powerful enough that when they get out of prison, they don't return and they, they wind up living their lives out as upright, righteous men and women. But of course, everything to Bill has to be evil and negative that Islam has to, you know, for him, everything has to be evil and negative and it's all about them. It's all about the whites, about the hate, the hate, they're teaching the hate. No, no. Sorry, Bill. No, that's not what it is. Which is the ultimate reformation of a, of a prisoner, which is to be a, lead an ethical life, I don't see how this would be anything but political in nature. Is there really a religion or is this a disguise as a government? Well, the answer is yes. Islam is actually a true religion because it preaches a doctrine which will prevent you from going to hell and give you paradise after death. But it is also a political system. I gave a lot of study to this and found out that if you take Quran, Sirah, Hadith and count up all the words that deal with us, and that's 51% of the text, Islam is about 50-50, half political and half religious. The religion is no concern to me at all. How do we break the unity of the Ummah? This was an interesting question because it was written in by someone who had a, what appeared to be an Islamic name. Well, the way to deal with Islam is simple. You teach all Muslims what the true nature of Muhammad is. You teach them the Sunnah. See, now, here, here we go. Here. How, how do, that's, that is an interesting question. How do they break the unity of the Ummah, the questioner asked? Bill. That's a, that is an interesting question. It's very, and that is an interesting question indeed. But it's not a new question because if you look in the past, there are writings from uh, different European colonizers who wanted to know the same thing. 
They, they, they were saying the same thing. How can they break the unity of the Muslim? How can they destroy Islam? How can they destroy the Muslim? Break their will. So that's not a, that's really that's not a new question, but it is an, an you know in this day and time it is an interesting question. But it's not new. It's been put put forward before, where co European colonizers wanted to know how could they break the the unity of the Muslims. You see, but Bills again. You see, you see what he his answer was. Well, just tell people about the true nature of Muhammad. No, sir, Bill. No, that that's first of all. If, if people see the true nature of Muhammad, which has happened, people actually come become Muslim because they see, they find out that you, Bill, and people like you have been lying. Many people after 9-11 wanted to do just that. After 9-11, they heard that Islam was evil and 9-11 shocked them. So they wanted to study this religion that they thought was evil and violent. And there are many stories of people who after doing so, they wound up becoming Muslims. Why, Bill? Because they found out Right, they did find the true nature of Islam, but not the true nature of Muhammad that you think. Not the true nature of Muhammad that you put forward in your slanderous lies about Muhammad. When these people study Islam unbiasedly, Bill, they did see the true nature of Muhammad. They did see the true nature of Islam and it motivated them, it inspired them to actually become Muslim themselves. There are many stories after 9-11 of people who hated Islam and so they wanted to read about this hateful religion. And then they started, you know, so-called hateful religion. And when they started to read about it, they found out that it wasn't hateful. They found out that 9-11 did not represent Islam. And many of these people became Muslims themselves, Bill. Proving that your, your, your strategy will fail, Bill. If they read true, honest, right, sources about Muhammad, they will... See that Islam is not what you are putting forward, Bill, as has been done. Many people became Muslim after 9-11, and they were hostile to Muslim. They were hostile to Islam, and so they wanted to know about what they thought was this evil, violent religion. But when they read about it, they saw it was beautiful. I even saw, wasn't, wasn't there, even in other countries, wasn't there one of those, the guys who was with Gert Wilders, right? One of Gert Wilders' partners, who, who was his partner in uh, attacking Islam, he wound up becoming a Muslim, not Gert Wilders, but his partner, one of his uh, associates, one of his, uh, you know, uh, one of the people that worked with him in attacking Islam. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't know. I don't know the brother's name, but he became a Muslim. He studied Islam and then he wound up becoming a Muslim. That's the power when people actually read and find out the true, as you said, the true nature of Muhammad. But it's not the true nature in your context, in your false narrative about him, Bill. So I'm sorry. No, that that's good. That strategy will backfire. You better off telling people to keep going to your to only listen to your lies. To the question who asked Bill that question, the only way you can break that is to have them keep listening to your lies about Islam. If you do, if you let them honestly look at the true nature of who Muhammad was and who Islam was, your 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 little tip, your advice is going to backfire on you. The same way it backfired after 9/11 when people read and became Muslim and found out that Islam is not what you say it is. So if you tell them to do that, Bill, and they read on actual real sources of Islam, your, your little strategy would backfire on you, Bill. You're better off telling them to just listen to you and your lies. And you teach them the Sirah, you teach them the Hadith. That's the way to do it. It's the best way to change a Muslim's mind about Islam is to simply teach him what Islam really says. Yeah, and when you teach them what Islam really says, they'll find out that you've been nothing but a liar, Bill. So yeah, when you teach them what Islam really says, as I've shown in many of my videos, they'll find out that you guys, you, David Wood, apostate prophet, uh, Christian Dents, they'll find out, Robert Spence, they'll find out that you guys have been lying to them. That's what they're going to find out. They'll find out that you guys have been lying to them. That's what they're going to find out. Find out that you guys are nothing but liars. And hate-filled bigots. Could you please enumerate the inaccuracies of the Quran? Well, I'm going to tell you the same answer I did earlier. You can find out the inaccuracies and errors in the Quran if you'll go to DuckDuckGo. And you can find out where those so-called inaccuracies are refuted and exposed and shown to be not an accuracy of the Quran, but the ignorance and mistake of the person who claimed that it was an inaccuracy in the Quran. That's what you'll find out. There are many people who have videos 
on uh, you know articles and everything who written who've written articles who expose that these so-called inaccuracies are not inaccuracies at all and then you find out that the, the the mistake was made not by the Quran but by the person who made the claim it was their own ignorance it was their own stupidity that they made the claim not and, and thought the Quran had an inaccuracy or an error when it was really their own accuracy their own lack of comprehension in reading skills oh are brave as browsers and just type in in change for their life or they give it a choice between conversion and death. Well, the inaccuracies in the Quran, and you'll come up with more reading than you want to do in an afternoon. Does it allow atheists and those of non-monotheistic faith to pay the extortion tax, the jizya, to exchange for their life, or are they given a choice between conversion and death? Well, the only ones who are given choice to convert are those who have people of the book, but this has been adapted to include Hindus, Jews, Christians, and others which have a religious text. But this is a small thing and in general is unimportant. We're not yet to the point where Islam is demanding that we pay the jizya. They just, where they're just demanding that we accommodate ourselves to the Sharia. Why is it allowed in our government, government and who opposes it? All right, uh, again, more, more paranoid nonsense. You're not being asked to accommodate Sharia at all, Bill. This, this is, these are just the paranoid and false claims of a bunch of bigots. Who want to spread fear monger? Who want, who want to fear monger? The reality is that m Muslims in Western countries are living in Western countries, and they are practicing Sharia law amongst themselves. Like I practice Sharia law myself. I don't eat pork. Right? I don't eat pork. So I, I impose Sharia law upon myself. I don't eat pork. I don't drink alcohol or or, or smoke weed or. or you know, mess with drugs and intoxicants. Why? Because that's what Islam says. I am, I'm opposed. So I'm not asking the West. To, I don't need to ask them to accommodate. I just avoid it. Right? I just oppose it on myself and stay away from, from, from doing that. Plain and simple. Right? Plain and simple. So, you know, they, they keep saying that the Muslims are trying to accommodate, asking the No, oh man, y'all just really need to stop. This is nothing more than a bunch of bigoted nonsense and fear mongering. Just the same. Well, it's real simple. Muslims show up, knock on the doors of the senators and the congressmen, and say, we're here, from, and we're Muslims, and we want to explain to you how Islam is a wonderful sorry, thing. Let's get that next question. Hold on. Okay, the jizya. They just, well, they're just demanding that we accommodate ourselves to the Sharia. Why is it allowed in our government, government and who opposes it? Well, it's real wait, 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 wait. First of all, what do you mean, why is it allowed? Uh, America promises freedom of religion. So what do you mean, why is it allowed? Because America promises freedom of religion and religious expression. That's why it's allowed. Case closed. You don't got to say nothing else. All this BS that Bill is talking about because they're knocking on people's doors. Oh, but you don't say nothing about the Israelis knocking on your doors, huh? Hmm? You don't say nothing about the Israelis knocking on politicians' doors and getting you to support Zionism, right? That's okay. So, but Muslims, we, we, we can't advocate for ourselves in your society, Bill? Hmm? We're not allowed to have, we live here too, so we can't knock on a politician's door and say, hey, you know, uh, uh, can you make sure that we have our rights to religious freedom as the Constitution it promises us? Ah, oh, you are nothing but a damn bigot. Simple. Muslims show up, knock on the doors of the senators and the congressmen, and say, we're here, from, and we're Muslims, we want... Notice, right? You see the hypocrisy, right? He won't, he won't talk about the Israelis knocking on their doors, though. The Israelis can knock on your door on a politician's door, lobby them, give them money, and that's okay. That's okay. That, that, that's all right. But we Muslims, we, we, can't, we can't do that. Right? Every other group does that. Why can't the Muslims do that? The Latino immigrants can do that. They can ask for the politicians to accommodate the, the Latino immigrants. Right? Let gay, look at the gay people. The LGBT, they do that. They advocate. They they go knocking on politicians' door saying, "Hey, let let them do this and do that." So why can't the Muslims do that, Bill? Aren't we part of this society too, you bigot? You see, these people. I tell you, I want to explain to you how Islam is a wonderful thing. Who do you know in your life who's ever gone and talked to a politician about the nat true nature of Islam? I know of just a handful. So. The no, and again, remember, when he says true nature, he's, again, he's only talking about his white, bigoted perspective. 
his white to him his white bigoted false perspective of Islam is the so-called true nature but we know what the true nature of Islam is okay we know what the true nature of Islam is it's not your false bigoted perspective of Islam right it's not your false bigoted perspective of Islam bill that is the true nature of Islam okay no, not that. The true nature of Islam is as I have shown numerous times on this channel where I have exposed and I've shown with proof. I haven't just talked about it. I've shown the evidence of the true nature of Islam that it is not violent, that it does not teach to randomly kill unbelievers just because you're unbelievers, that it does not teach to, uh, uh, to subjugate and conquer and, and, you know, and, and dominate just for the hell of being dominant Islam. No, I've shown this. I've shown the verses from the Quran. I've shown what scholars had to say about it. We've shown the evidence from the Islamic sources to make that case and not just give you lip service. So you're wrong, Bill. You're wrong. You don't, you're just wrong and you're distorting, you're twisting. And I'll go as far as to say you're lying. The reason that our government reflects the will of Islam and not us is, is we make it very clear that we're not interested in dealing with it. We talk. No, Bill. The reason why the government allows it is because, again, hey, remember what I told you guys, that these white bigots, they don't really believe in the Constitution. See? They don't really believe in the ideals. And this is proof right here. The argument that he's making is, uh, he, what he should say is, oh, the reason why they allow it is because the Constitution allows freedom of religion. That should be Bill Warner's answer, not this bunk, white supremacist, bigot bullshit that he's talking about right now, right? What he's saying right now is not the answer. His answer should have been, oh, the reason why our government allows it is because the Constitution of the United States says you have the right to freedom of religion and freedom of religious expression. That's the answer to the person not this garbage that he's talking about is that all oh, because our politicians don't want to do the will of no 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 it's because the law says it's allowed that's the answer to the question the rest of what he says is garbage and we really don't need to hear it we don't really it doesn't need nothing further needs to be said i believe that was the last question in which repeatedly it is said that islamists have waged jihad against the Catholic world until they're subjugated. Oh, yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah, let, let's hear that part. So, this is an answer to 20 questions, and one of the things. Yeah, I want to refute that part. We talk about it quietly amongst ourselves instead of becoming political activists. Is political Islam designed to dominate globally? Yes, the short answer to that. It is a doctrine in which repeatedly it is said that Islamists have waged jihad against the Catholic world until they're subjugated under Islam. That so, is a lie, Bill. That's, that's a bold faced lie. You, you, you just told a bold-faced lie. As I've shown on my other, when we did the other shows, right? Remember when I talked about this on my other shows? We showed how the Quran says very clearly that your job is only to deliver the message. Remember when I showed you that? Remember we did that show? And I showed you there were over a dozen verses where Allah said over and over again that your job is only to deliver the message. If they reject it, if they refuse it, if they return away from it, over and over again Allah says your job is only to deliver only to deliver. You're not their guardian. You're not their keeper. I have not made you a, a guardian over them. I have not made put you in charge of them. So Bill, no, you're wrong. You lied. Islam does not say that you have to fight the Kafir until uh, Islam is dominant over them and they're subjugated. That's a lie, Bill. And I challenge you on that, Bill. And anybody who's a follower of Bill, if, let him know that I'm challenging him, that I'm calling him out. That I'm telling him that I, I, I'm willing to take him on in a one-on-one -on -one debate on this subject. Let him know that. So, Bill, if you see this, I'm letting you know that. If anybody who's a follower of Bill sees this, tell Bill. I want all of y'all to keep telling Bill. Flood his, his inbox, his Twitter, whatever, his YouTube. Flood it, flood it, flood it, flood it with, with this video. Let him know that Mr. Islam Answers Back, Shadi Lewis, has put Bill on notice. That I'm calling you out. I'm exposing you, Bill. What you just said right there. Matter of fact, I would debate you on that, just that topic alone. I'll debate you on that topic alone and expose you as a fraud and a liar. On just that topic right there to expose that you're lying. That Islam does not say, oh, we have to fight and, and subjugate until there's no, that's a lie. That is a lie and I've shown that already. 
right again anybody interested I have the notes just join my patreon and you you can have access to the notes to all the notes that I have of all the verses that prove that what Bill just said is a lie that it is not out to dominate that it actually says the opposite that if you reject Islam and you turn away Allah says your job is only to deliver the message there's no compulsion in religion everybody knows that verse right everybody knows that verse every Muslim knows no compulsion in religion Chapter 2, verse 255, 256, right? No compulsion in the deen. Everybody knows that. Everybody, every, pretty much every Muslim is aware of that verse. Okay? So, I'm sorry, Bill, but no, you're, you're wrong. That's a bold-faced lie. Okay? And that concludes the rebuttal to Bill Warner's 20 questions. This guy is something else, though, I'm telling you. But then again, he's no different from the rest of them. He's no different from the rest of these white bigots against Islam. And remember, I told you, the reason why I say white bigot is because that's what it is. The motivating factor behind this anti-Muslim bigotry is white bigotry. The same way the anti-immigrant stance is about white bigotry. All of this, the common denominator, remember what I said, this, remember what I told you, brothers and sisters. The common denominator is white bigotry. That's the common denominator, whether it be, whether, whether when you hear the anti-immigrant stuff that's going on in America, in Europe, Right, when you hear this anti-immigrant stuff in in in, in um, you know in, in Europe in, in, and in in America, the, co the 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 motivating factor is white bigotry. This anti the the, the attack on Islam is bigotry, white bigotry. That's it's, the, it's so another yes. That's that's what's behind it. It's motivated by white racism. That's the motivation behind it. Okay, so. I would I really would love to to, to get Bill on a one-on-one -on -one, in a one-on-one -on -one debate I, I would I really would love that I, I matter of fact I make dua that Allah make that happen same way when I made dua to debate Robert Spencer and alhamdulillah I wound up getting a call that hey we want you to debate Robert Spencer so inshallah pray that somebody ha has the means to set up and one day call me and say hey uh, mr. mr. Lewis we got a we want we like we would like you to come to debate mr. Bill Warner Inshallah, I pray that that happened. I pray that Allah allows that to become a reality like he did when it was time to debate Robert Spencer. MashaAllah. Of course, if the brothers and, if the brothers and sisters uh, support my platform and, and sponsor me, I may be able to come up and I may be able to make it happen myself. Of course, that would still, you know, it would still be through Allah, but I may be able to actually put it together myself and not have to wait for a phone call I may have the means to actually put up my own debate and then I could give Bill a call and say, Bill, um, I would like to invite you to a debate. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll fly you out to Atlanta and you know what I mean? So inshallah, if the brothers and sisters can support me or put me in contact with somebody who has the means to fund me in, in a large way, I might be able to actually put that together myself and not have to wait to be called. I can actually make the calls myself, inshallah. You know what I'm saying? And then I can start calling people myself and see if they how what they really. I could call Christian Prince and say, "Hey, I got a debate set up for you. Are you gonna come?" Then we don't have to wait to be, you know, you know what I mean. We don't we don't have to wait to receive phone calls. We can start making the phone calls ourselves, inshallah. We can start putting together our debates, and we can invite them to debate instead. Instead of me having to wait for somebody to call me, we can put our own debates on and call them out, inshallah. So that's the wish, that's the dream, that's the goal, inshallah. But for now, we pray that Allah can make it happen in some way, shape, or form, whether it's by me getting the means to set up the debate myself or somebody one day calling me and saying, hey, we'd like, you, we'd like to fly you out for a debate <laughs> against Bill Warner or one of these people, inshallah. All right. But that concludes our refutation of Mr. Bill Warner and his 20 questions right there. So, uh, let's see, before we end it off, let's see what, what the comments were. Ask them Israel first for America. <laughs> that's, that's a good one, Brother Shazad. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because sometimes you, the way they talk, it's like they do. It's like they put, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as if they put um, uh, Israel before America. Like the way they were getting mad at Sister Ilhan. Oh, she attacked Israel. I'm like, well, first of all, why is that even an issue? If she if she has something to say about Israel, that that shouldn't even be part of a, of your attack on her, because Israel is another country. 
So if she says something bad about another country, who the hell cares? It ain't it ain't America, right? It ain't America. So who the hell cares if she says something bad about allegedly says something bad about Israel? It's not our country. Right? She's not obligated to love another country. So what the hell if she did say something bad about Israel? Right? But yeah, that, that proves that they uh, some of these people put Israel first above America. Shoot. Right? It's uh it's at his his email, uh well at least his Twitter, you could get him on Twitter. It may be his email too, but it's at political islam, right? At political islam. That's how you can get in contact with him on Twitter. Uh, that might be his email. I don't know. It may be, you know, with the email, you got to look, go, probably go to his, go to, go to, go, go to at political Islam on Twitter and you probably be able to find his email and send him a message like that. So yeah, I'm asking all my people to flood, send him emails, send him messages on Twitter, uh, Facebook, email, whatever. And, uh, um, where else? Uh, and, and, you know, let him know that I'm looking for him. <laughs> let him know I'm looking for him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, all right, so we'll go ahead and end it with that. Inshallah, I'm going to see if I, like I said, I'm trying to do more videos. Just had some extra free time. But I appreciate you guys, your support. Appreciate you guys watching. Uh, remember, I'm still trying to get 10 supporters. My goal is still trying to get 10 supporters on Patreon. Unfortunately, I dropped down to seven from eight. We were almost there. We only, we only needed two more. But uh, we lost the person, so I'm down to seven. So I need three people, right? I need three more people. I need, I need just three more people to get us up to ten supporters. Now, understand that maybe maybe we're losing. We lost the person because they didn't understand the process. So understand if you if you become Patreon, Patreon is to meant to be like a month a month to month support. So if you want if you just want to give a one time donation, then you're better off using. The other means you know you're better off sending it through PayPal or Cash App, because maybe that might that might be the problem. Maybe the person thought it was a one time and then because they're gonna charge you every month. They're gonna debit your your uh, whatever whatever means you use to to send your donation uh, every month. So if you're not prepared to donate every month, then you're better off doing a one time donation or a random donation on the Cash App or the PayPal. When you use Patreon, that's really meant to be an ongoing. You know, like you're, you're willing to support me on an ongoing basis. So if you're going to use Patreon, be prepared to have your, your whether you're using your PayPal or credit card or whatever, to be debited once a month. They debit you once a month and send the, you know, send your donation to me like that. So if you're not prepared to do that, then it's better off if you just send it on PayPal or um, on Cash App. All right. So understand if you're going to become the Patreon sponsor, that's meant to be a, a pledge. You're making a pledge. To support whatever amount you, you, you pledge once a month, all right? Okay? So I just wanted to make that clear so you understand that, okay, inshallah. But again, I'm, my goal is 10. My goal is to get 10 patrons um, at 7 right now. So I need just three people. A brother, a sister, three person, three more people to bring us up to 10. Once we get 10, then inshallah we can aspire to the next level and try to go for them. But right now the goal is to get 10. Okay, inshallah. All right, brothers and sisters, uh, I appreciate you staying up late with me tonight, and I'll see you on the next show, probably, uh, maybe tomorrow, I don't know, or, uh, or, or like the regular show, we'll get try to get back on schedule for Sunday, inshallah. All right, you guys have a good night or a good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Assalamu alaikum.